We're put on these things. We're putting on, don't be children anymore. Don't be a child. And the church is filled with children and not physical children, right? Mental children. Morning, everybody. We've got some preaching and preacher clips on trial. Coming up next. is Confitas. Welcome, welcome. Uh, new subscribers, thanks for coming along. Uh, drop a comment, tell me know where you're from. Tell me know. Tell me know? Let me know where you're from. Anybody know Bucky's in Texas? I'm not, I'm not a Texan. I'm a Californian, although I live in Kentucky now with my wife and four children, and I'm a pastor of a small church, and I do this YouTube channel, among other things. I like gardening, stuff like that. Used to like sports, not really like sports anymore. Anyway, that's not what this is about. What this is about is together for the Gospel Coalition. They just mix them all together. No, the Gospel Coalition, you know, the green logo people, um, started with D.A. Carson a number of years ago and has had a lot of great articles over the years and had a lot of terrible articles over the years. More terrible recently than not. And we're going to look at one that may seem like, hey, you know what? That's a that's a good idea. That's that makes sense. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean we're not I'm not gonna in Christian love and First Corinthians thirteen style I'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt. I'm gonna believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Thing thing things. And uh I don't know. But Trevin Wax is very popular there. He's written a number of posts, number of posts, of course, books and other things as well. And he wrote this article. So let's look at it. And um, we're going to look at scripture as well. So let's take a look. All right. Gotcha sermon clips are bad for the church. From the Gospel Coalition, Trevin Wax, January 25th, 2022, 15 years ago, an outlandish sermon clip made the rounds on YouTube. It was a shock jock independent pastor ranting in front of a tiny congregation about modern Bible translations. It's comical, unnerving, and cringe-inducing, all the right words. I shared on my blog. I was new to blogging, etc., etc., and it says, who is edified by this sermon video? An older, wiser pastor asked him. And then he encouraged me to resist the urge to share something that just because it was outrageous, entertaining, and co or a cautionary tale of how not to preach. Okay. Uh, let's all keep that in our back pocket um, because that's going to come in handy here in a moment. Sermon and sermon clips. I thought about the conversation recently as I predated Twitter and Instagram and prevalence of sermon clips that are now in cir circulate far and wide. Yes. For the past 500 years, sermons were spread mainly in form of pamphlets and books. That's correct. Radio stations, of course, and then decades with tape ministries. John MacArthur, Grace to You, Alistair Begg, um, many others, Adrian Rogers, those types of guys. And I've heard this as well. This is interesting. There have been many outliers, of course. Martin Lloyd-Jones believe people experience a sermon differently when they hear it in the congregation. I would completely agree. To that. The preacher in person really does make a difference. <clears throat> the spirit is dwelling with that man right then and there, and he's dealing with you right then and there. I would advocate ultimately, yes, if you're going to listen, you have to listen weekly in person to a message as it's happening. Uh, but you can listen to other sermons as well, but that guy is not your pastor, right? Unless, of course, it is your pastor and you missed because you were sick or something. But by and large, you can't just listen to a bunch of sermons and then expect to get the same result as being there on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, something like that, Wednesday night, whatever, and having that same interaction, the spirit really doing, because we're so methodical and we're so just kind of sterile when it comes to our spiritual life. And this is one of the examples of it. We just sit in isolation listen to sermons online and so on, and not really in person. I would definitely agree with Martin Lloyd-Jones and Wax's point here. Today, not only sermon podcasts and videos are made available, but sermon clips circulate around and around. Great. We know all that. Weaponized sermon clips is where we want, we want to get to. There's a flip side of the sharing the gospel moments. And it's good. Again, I'm thankful that I can hear Martin Lloyd-Jones or I can hear A.W. Tozer or Adrian Rogers or somebody like that, uh, or sermons that from pastors that I don't, 
I'm not in their church, but I can hear them. They were preached last week, last year, 10 years ago, and be edified by them. But it's not the same in being in person. But he's really going after like woke preacher clips on YouTube and many others, discernment blogs and so on. And of course, I've done a few of these where I've specifically looked at a sermon or something and articulated it in a way of um, dissecting it and taking it apart and saying, this is wrong, this is wrong, and so on. And I think it's very helpful. That's why I'm doing this video because it's it's he's defending it in kind of squishy middle of the road uh, evangelicalism of our day. And oh, we don't really have to do that. Well, yeah, we did have to do that. We do have to do that. Do we have to do it as much? No, there are people and some colleagues that I have online that have been dwelling too much on certain false teachers and the like. And it's easy all hanging fruit, but we still need to do it. Calling out Ed Litton and his plagiarism and his theft, uh, calling out Tim Keller's nonsense or David Platt's nonsense when it's repeated, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Flip side, social media accounts now feature most outlandish moments from preachers or teachers who belong to another camp or tribe. Yeah, that's true. We all like to pick at other people who are not in our tribe. I understand that. I do it. You do it. We all do it. Uh, it doesn't mean it's right. doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just what it is. Some of these are fundamentalists or most woke. Yep, that's true. Worst caricatures. Yes. However, some of these teachers are indeed prolific Bible teachers. They're, they're scholars, theologians. They've written commentaries and they pastor churches of a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand. Joel Osteen, you know, we don't really need to pick on Joel Osteen because he's just so bad and he's been consistently bad and yet people still listen to him. You know, and if I meet somebody who listens to Joel Osteen, I might have to shake them. But the average Christian knows Joel Osteen, if at best, should be held at very, very distant arm's length, but or just reject it altogether. I, I advocate reject altogether. But he's kind of saying, well, you know, caricatures and worse care. Like, but David Platt, is he a worse caricature? But Matt Chandler, Ed Litton stealing sermons? Are these things uh, worse caricatures? Now, I understand, you know, MacArthur has said some goofy things. We've all said some goofy things. So I get that. And sometimes there's things that I don't agree with. Or, you know, even Tim Keller or David Platt, or excuse me, John Piper. Um, and others who, you know, say ridiculous stuff. Is this what he's talking about? I'm not really sure. At times, we see clips from charismatic megachurch pastors delivering inspirational drivel rather than sound biblical theology. Teaching, right? Up. Yeah, we see that. It appears is to name and shame the bad preacher and shake one's head in pity or disgust. Okay. Even worse, in many cases, sermon excerpts become ammunition on ongoing battles. Well, yes, but a lot of this ongoing battle is because of the his own person, right? David Platt. John MacArthur, right? Both these guys are in churches, and it's hard to really wager uh, what they mean, or not wager, um, understand what they're saying in their intentions. But the point is, they're saying it. And they are saying specifically to a congregation, yes. But they're also trying to do, I mean, this is, I did a video on this, anti-religious liberty, and I've done videos on Platt. Um you know, I would advocate for religious liberty, but again, I don't know if that was really what MacArthur was saying. And even David Platt, he's, you know, trying to be emotional and trying to be kind and, you know, love people. And I get that. I want to give the benefit of the doubt. But the problem is we're not just weaponizing it to laugh at people. At least I'm not. I don't know. I can't really speak for anybody else. I, I see people being led astray. And we're going to look at multiple scripture references right here as we do that. Weaker pulpit. I don't believe it's a widespread sharing of bad moments and preaching will make the pulpit stronger. I completely disagree. If you, listen, at, at the advent of Ed Litton, I've talked to several people, several uh, pastor friends, guys in seminary. They were in seminary. Now they're in uh, churches. And they indeed felt completely called to be more exacting with their citations, with knowing what they're doing, and far being, being far higher and alerted to what they're citing, how they're citing it, making sure it's it's their content and not somebody else's. So I completely disagree that if somebody's watching my sermons, which who you know some people do, I guess, um, I'll drop a link if you're curious about the pastor, the church I pastor, but feel free, watch it. I'm not above correction by any means. And if I said something weird, ask for a correction or ask the church or something like that, or my 
the church I pastor can ask me that as well. So this indeed will make a stronger pulpit because people will be more careful. Men will be more careful to not be picked apart. Because I preach, I don't know if it's going to end up on CNN. You know, it's probably not. Or on YouTube. It's probably not in the sense of being ridiculed. But I'm not just going to spout out outlandish nonsense that I'm not willing to at least stand back, stand behind, or deny and say, yeah, that was stupid, right? We need, we need to have our words be exacting. Anyone who seeks to rightly handle the word of God knows the feeling of inadequacy in preaching. Yeah, of course, we've said something at, you know, age 20 or whatever he was saying. I shut up for the 20-something uh, learning to preach and knowing the potential misstep, bad theology, analogy, aberrant theological point can be taken and broadcast to thousands of people an example of not to do. But is that not how we learn? That's exactly how we learn. This is the whole participation trophy, it seems, Mindset. Oh, everybody gets a trophy because we you know we don't want people to feel like they were left out. These this team lost and that team lost and this team lost. But you know what? You all get a trophy still. No. Who won the game? Two teams are competing. If there isn't a winner and a loser, why are we competing? What's the point? How are we not building character and learning and growing and being sharpened? How paralyzing for a young preacher. Uh, I don't I don't I don't think it's paralyzing at all. I've been preaching far less time than Trevin Wax. I don't know how long he's been, but he said it was 15 years ago he's been doing this. So this is, you know, at least 2007 he started, maybe even before that. Okay? Well, I was terrified the first couple times I preached. I'm still getting nervous from time to time. But I want to make sure what I'm saying is exacting because I'm before the Lord. I want to edify people, teach people, instruct people, call people to repentance, call people to action. That's what preaching is, not just teaching, but preaching. The church has endured bad and sloppy preaching. Through the centuries, yes, we could talk about Chrysostom, Augustine, and Luther. He pulls no punches here. Talks about uh, Luther's anti-Semitism. Okay. Now, this is really one other thing. Does it edify? And this, you know, and, and it convicts me sometimes because sometimes I feel like, yeah, I don't know. Should I do this? Is this really helpful? It really does seem to be helpful more than it's not, right? So he can't really speak for those who are helped by it. I've been helped by it. Uh, in different ways. Now, sometimes it is laughable and it's just so bad if somebody's talking about you need to have a vaccine and a mask to follow Jesus or you're not loving your neighbor if you're not getting vaxxed or blah, 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 blah. It's just goofy. It's terrible. Um, you know, some of these are just caricatures of the caricature. It's so bad. But really, what at least what I'm trying to do most of the time and with my channel and drop a comment, let me know if I'm, if I'm dropping the ball or, or I'm too much on this. But Focus on those who have the biggest influence and are at least in my sphere that I know of and they're making an impact that's good, bad, or otherwise. I can hear howls and protests. Yes, we're protecting the pulpit. We're instructing our people. Yeah, and that's what, I, that's what I'm doing. We are instructing the people, but it's also to know that if you call somebody out and you say, hey, that's not right, which we've lacked doing you know, for the last several decades, then people continue to revel in the light. The scripture talks about reveling in the darkness, right? People have to do it at night. They have to go hide in the woods. They have to go hide behind a supermarket because it's shameful. Getting high, getting drunk, going with a prostitute, having illicit sex, et cetera, et cetera. That's all shameful, right? Worshiping demons, killing black cats on Halloween. All these things are shameful. So people do it at night. And if you call people out, you question them, then they continue to hide their sin, right? Now, in one sense, you want them to repent of their sin, but it's better than the coarsening of society where everything's now just permissible. So this is, this is going to make a stronger pulpit, or at least get people to be more careful and more exacting. It's not going to be way, make a weaker pulpit at all. Yes, we can, and sometimes should have sustained a, substantive disagreements with sermons. We shouldn't cover up Luther's anti-Semitism writings. There's a lot more on this, by the way, if you're really interested. Dig a lot deeper and look at Luther's um, sermons, the ones in question, and look at the uh, Jewish establishment of his day and make a decision for yourself. I used to believe this, and then I read some other things. That's not the point of this video, but uh, I think Luther's being misrepresented here. But anyway, um, but surely there's difference between careful, instructive engagement and social media-driven gotcha clips. Yeah, and I agree with that. I mean, again, I have several friends who have been focusing on uh, a few false teachers and, you know, one in particular, and it's just too much. It's just too much. It's like, all right, move on, move on. Do something else. Teach. Don't just always critique. Don't always be critical. Do a gotcha sermon clips. Build up the church and honor the gravity of what happens in the moment of preaching. Or do they kick... 
or they risk reducing a pastor to a bad moment, reinforcing a stereotype that might be unfair or false, and considering isolation from the rest of his ministry. Right, so in isolation of the rest of his, his ministry. Is, did David Platt say one or two things about whiteness and being a white pastor and he's fragile and this and, this and that? Yeah, sure, he said that before. But he said that like multiple times, multiple times. And if you don't bring this up and say, well, there's this and then there's this and there's this and, you know, he closed his church uh, during the summer of 2020 and then marched in BLM rallies. And it's like, how is that not hypocrisy? How is that helping the church? Calling out David Platt is something that David Platt needs because he's he's clearly straying. He's erring in some way. He really is. And it's not just a clickbait, gotcha clip, whatever, but rather to help him, to help others. You've been taken in by this man, right? There've been people who've been taken in by all sorts of cult leaders and groups over the years. People have been taken in by all sorts of, I mean, John Piper's been saying, silly stuff off and on through this pandemic. Francis Chan used to be really solid, but then he kind of goes waffling back and forth. Now there's a lot of people in quote unquote my camp that think he's a total heretic. I don't think he is, but I don't think he's been exacting with his words either. Even John MacArthur saying goofy things that you're like, nah, that doesn't make any sense, dude. What are you talking about? You know, it's it's hard. And obviously having a sustained ministry for a length of time, any more than, you know, a few years, you're going to say some stuff that's wrong or bad, but then you have to come and say, okay, are you being corrected? And are you taking the correction? Are you hearing? Are you apologizing to the actual, you know, congregation and whatever? Or are you going to double down? This isn't just a one or two time thing, right? Ed Litton just didn't just borrow one or two sermons. He stole multiple sermons, dozens, hundreds of sermons probably. You know, David Platt, Matt Chandler, these guys, uh, Andy Stanley, you know, they're, they're furthering their false gospel. They're not, it's not just one or two bad things. And so, I don't know, whenever these clips cross my free, coming to pray for the grace and discernment of the pastors to seek to divide the word. Yeah, we should ultimately be seeking to divide the word of God. I get it. I get it. We absolutely should. That's my goal. My goal in the pulpit, especially, is not to call out people. That's why I have a separate YouTube channel. That's what you're watching right now. But let's look at some scripture references. Calling out false teaching. Romans 16, 17 and 18. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles, contrary to the doctrine which you have been taught. Contrary. There's part of my word. Contramundum, right? Against. There it is. Contra. There it is, right? There. Oh. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, wow. That's so harsh, Paul. Are you sure they're not just, you sure they're not just kind of uh, people who just don't really know, are they, you know, oh, maybe they just misunderstood, maybe they misspoke. But their own appetites, smooth talking flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. And that's the key right there. Naive. People are naive. People listen to Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes, Stephen Furtick, and Marcus Rogers. They listen to these people, these teachers, and Andy Stanley. I mean, it, on and on. It's, it's, because people are naive. They want to believe something false. Ephesians 5, 11, take no part on fruitful works of darkness, but expose them. Oh, no, no, we're supposed to just ignore them. That's not what Paul says. Colossians 2, 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. But it's not just Paul, right? Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets. Beware. How are you beware? Are you going to tell people? They're not going to just come up out of nowhere. Not everybody has the same discernment. Not everybody has the same smarts and abilities. God has granted different uh, functions for both men and women, different things. Even certain men have certain gifts and abilities. Certain women have certain gifts and abilities that other men and other women don't have, right? Come come to you in sheep's clothing, right? They're wearing a robe. They're, they've got a little, it's not that they're dressed like a sheep. That's always, you know, people misunderstand that. At least I thought that as a kid. You're like, ah, oh, it's a little sheep. He's like, ah, bah. Pretending like a man pretending to be a sheep. No, this guy's pretending to be a shepherd. He's sheep's clothing. He's wearing a robe and he's got a, a staff and a hood and the whole thing, right? He looks like a shepherd. But in really, he's really a wolf. Right? He's a wolf, you know, the old uh, Little Red Riding Hood sort of thing. 2 Peter 2 1. But false prophets arose among the people. This is talking about past tense, just as there will be false teachers among you. So this already happened, right? But then this is still applying to us today. False teachers apply. To us today. They come in, secretly bring in destructive heresies. That's the thing, Trevin. Destructive heresies. It's not just, 
oh, it's a bad sermon here and there. Oh, you know, it's just, oh, gotcha sermon. Oh, dude, oh it's not, he's not really, it, uh, he just, he was kind of misunderstood and okay. Yes, it does edify. The answer, yes. Now, does it always do that? No. I think sometimes woke, woke preacher clips goes a little too far. He's a little too much. But that's his whole shtick, right? And so he's not claiming to be a pastor. He's not claiming to be a teacher. He's not claiming to be anything. He's just exposing the unfruitful deeds of darkness, right? <laughs> and yeah, I almost read that as wokes of darkness. Works of darkness, right? Jude 1.4, great chapter. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated. So listen, crept in unnoticed. How do they creep in unnoticed? Through the Southern Baptist Convention, through the PCA, through the Gospel Coalition, through Together for the Gospel, through Christianity Today, through Christianity.com, through what? Fill in the blank, right? They pervert the grace of our God. Is that not what most of these people are doing, especially the woke people? The woke mob, the critical theory, social justice warrior clowns, they're saying you need to do more. You need to apologize. You need to do this. You need to give reparations. You need to support Black Lives Matter. The organization, you need to support this. You need to support that. You can't ever vote for Donald Trump. You can't vote for this person. If you vote for you know any guy or this or whatever, you're having a problem. No, they're perverting the grace of God into sensuality. And how many times have false teachers come in and show that they are indeed sexual deviants. Ravi Zacharias. Now, unfortunately, Ravi Zacharias had pretty good teaching, although he told a lot of stories. Uh, it wasn't like crazy, you know, deep teaching, but it was college, colleges he would talk to, right? And, and he had a good, a good apologetics ministry uh, overall, though, you know, again, sensuality, and exposed him. To John 1.10, if anyone comes to you, and does not bring this teaching. Notice there's a distinction within the teaching. The teaching has to matter. There's certain teaching, there's certain other bad teaching. If they bring bad teaching, what should we do? Just say it's fine. It's all right. We're just going to ignore you. Or you know what? Don't talk about it. Just keep preaching the gospel. We should keep preaching the gospel. But do not receive him to your house or give him any greeting. That was a big deal back in the first century, right? Not greeting people. Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. That's, of course, the eschatological passage, which we're not going to talk about right now, but that's a great chapter as well. And then again, it's talking about then, it's talking about now. It's not talking about just then when we see Bible prophecy like this. I believe this actually applies to um, the first century, but anyway. Not just the New Testament, but Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 18. I won't read the whole thing. If a prophet or dreamer of dreams arises, notice if, the implication is that it's going to happen, and then what do we do about it? Among you and gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign of wonder he tells you comes to pass if he says, it, it, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet. So go back and read this because this you know, I'm getting a little long. But the point is, what should we do? Not listen to him. Don't listen to him or her. Right? Unfruitful deeds of darkness. Ezekiel 13, 9, my hand, it will be against the false prophets to see false visions and utter lying divinations. And it sounds like, oh, they're not, they're not using Ouija boards. They're not being crazy with their demon worship. They might as well be. Some of the doctrines they are preaching are doctrines of demons. I mean, this whole near two years of this uh, COVID nonsense that we've continued to endure, showing people just the hypocrisy of not meeting and masks and mandates and this and that and slavishly either rejecting everything the government says or slavishly obeying everything the government says, forgetting that God is the sovereign Lord, right? Jeremiah 14, 14. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. Uh-oh, that's not good. Prophets, now again, this is not just telling the, the future, but this is telling about what's happening right now. You can be a herald. You can be a prophet now. Don't get freaky. Not talking about prophecy in the sense of uh, speaking scripture or future casting. It's just prophetic. It's prophetic to say God judges the ungodly. God judges the unrepentant. God judges wickedness. And look at the wickedness in our culture, right? That's all prophetic words. Doesn't mean you're future casting. Doesn't mean you're telling crystal ball, nothing like that. That's what most of the prophets were doing. Now, they did write scripture, right? And they also were carried along by the Holy Spirit, which is what scripture is, being how it's 
being written. And they did, from time to time, uh, tell the future. Daniel, in particular, is a good example. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and delusions of their own minds. Their own minds, ladies and gentlemen. That is really, I think, the biggest thing. Their own minds. That, that matters a lot. Back in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 3, 4 through 4, 3 and 4, where the times are coming, and it already happened, this already happened, but it also still happens, so don't get weird. Sometimes people use this, like, oh, it's going, the Antichrist is right around the corner. Yeah, another video, that's another video. Uh, but time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. That already happened in the first century and into the second century with the Gnostics and uh, all the crazy Christ heresies. Christ is only a man. He's only God. He had a split personality. He wasn't really here. He was an apparition, on and on and on and on. He was adopted as a man to be God. I mean, they're all sort of, this all happened already. But it still happens, right? Having itching ears. Notice if this happens to you, if your ears are itching and you're thinking, ah, I'd rather have this, I really like that guy, I'd really rather have that type of teaching. Be careful. Be careful. They will accumulate for themselves teachers. And this is what people do. And this is why people watch Joel Osteen, right? Or Rick Warren, or Benny Hinn, or Stephen Furtick, or what's the the spit spitting guy? What's the spitting guy? Michael Todd. Michael Todd? Is that what? I had no idea who that was. Apparently he likes to spit on people. More than once. He's done it more than once. To suit their own passions, right? That's always something, oh, you got to be so careful. If you're ever on a church committee looking for a pastor or something like that, don't just look for someone who suits your own passions. Look for a man who preaches the word of God, who will not shy away, who will not hide, who will not be um, arrogant either in preaching the word of God, but rather knowing that it is God who he is preaching for ultimately goes on, who would turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. How many myths are in our world? How many lies constantly? I mean, daily. Just think about the lies once you, once you listen to this. Just think about how many lies you listen to just today. How many lies were told to you to believe? Whatever it is. You know what they are. I don't know what they are because I'm not actually a prophet, right? Not in the classical sense. Although I do pro prophesy, right? God judges the wicked. That, that's, a, that's a prophecy. Anyway, lastly, we're going to do this. Ephesians 4.14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. As for the person who stirs up division after warning him once or twice, have nothing to do with him. And then Colossians 2 again, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So we have to put on the armor of God. We have to see to it that no one takes us captive by empty deceit, by lying. We say, no longer are we to be children like a boat tossed around to and fro by waves, every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, trickery of men, men and women trying to get our money, trying to get our allegiance. No, if you don't find any helpful help in this video, in my content, don't continue to support. But if you do, please like and subscribe. Please, please like and subscribe. In fact, let's do this. Watch. Please like and subscribe. Hey, look at that. Make it all like red and then black and then like huge and then blue. Ah. <laughs> See to it that no one takes you captive according to the elemental spirits of the world. Notice there's always this comparison between the world and the word. God in his word and the world. Now, God made the world, yes, and he upholds the world, yes, but there is, there is straight heresy, lies at every turn. The world is full of craziness and not according to Christ. Make sure it's according to Christ. Make sure it's Jesus' words. The one who... The fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, filled in him, who's the head of rule and authority. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> I think Colossians 2 is probably one of the best um, things for this whole discussion. Ver verses. <laughs> Words are escaping me. 
See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. See to it. That means you can be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit. I know there might be some differences of opinion theologically, but that means you can be. Okay? The Bible is not going to give empty threats. The Bible doesn't have just randomness in it, but rather it's the word of God. And so when it says see to it, Paul is talking to the churches there. See to it. (laughs) Right? And that can apply to you and apply to me. See to it. Make sure. Make certain. Okay? According to what? The human tradition and elemental principles of the world. Now, I want to be fair. They're going too far, quote unquote, can easily happen. You know, God invented humor. He invented laughter. Uh, and, And sometimes, like Elijah, we mock because it deserves mocking because it's so stupid and so terrible. Sometimes you just cry. Sometimes you just shake your head. Um, I had to look up S-M-H recently. I see it all the time. And I'm like, what is that? I'm like, meh? <laughs> is, it, is it Hebrew? Is it just a weird expression? I'm like, no, nah, it's got to be like an LOL type of thing. And it is, shaking my head. I, I don't know. Sorry. I'm not as cool as I might appear. They didn't pay for this. Do I have to tell people that? They didn't pay me to say this. Some people do that all the time. I'm like, this is not a paid advertisement. Okay. I didn't ask if it was. But Titus, right? Ephesians. We're put on these things. We're putting on. Don't be children anymore. Don't be a child. And the church is filled with children. And not physical children, right? Mental children. And we have... Such, I mean, this is where we just have shenanigans. We have guys spitting on guys' faces, right? We have people sitting in these most outlandish sets on stage and doing these goofy things and, you know, clapping and yelling at people. Are you excited? I've been studying, and I don't know if I'll do a longer piece on it, maybe look for it in the future, uh, of just the charismatic y, Stephen Furtick y, Michael Todd. I just watched another guy last night, a guy out in um, Veal, Freel, Veal. Not Todd not Todd Friel. Um, he's a pastor out in Los Angeles, so it caught my eye. He looked like a hipster Mr. Rogers. <laughs> like, he had this green like cardigan sweater. And it was like super long, but like not crazy well, not crazy long, but it was long. And anyway. Don't do this. Don't be a child. Don't be immature, but rather be mature. Don't be like a boat being tossed to and fro, bouncing around. With no foundation. Conviction is belief beforehand. Okay? And you're making yourself see that and know that. And when this happens, then you know what to do. As opposed to saying, well, the church government told us to shut down. I guess we should do that. The government told us to do this. Well, this person came up and said they want to be a member. And since we don't have any member process, uh, you know, this sort of thing. What should we do when my daughter says she's pregnant? What should we do when this thing happens? What should we do? You know, there's all sorts of things that we've just completely... Our brains have fallen out. So anyway, I hope you found this helpful. Uh, Go ahead and like and subscribe. If you have not, please, the three-piece special, as my buddy Jason Whitaker, Dear Woke Christian channel says. Go check his channel out, too. I'll drop a comment, a comment, a link. I'll comment. He might comment. You might see it. He's worth subscribing to as well. He does a lot of great content. Uh, But he calls it a three-piece special. So do me the three-piece special, right? Click all the YouTube buttons. And uh, until next time, we'll see you on Friday.